broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Hello and welcome to another episode of Wilms Front. Thank you for joining me on this Friday evening. It is the 27th of September 2019 at 7 p.m. here in Melbourne which means tomorrow is the last Saturday in September, which means it's AFL Grand Final Day at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. This week it's the, or this season I should say, it's the Richmond Tigers up against the, the Greater Western Sydney Giants. The Grand Final Parade took place today and has been billed this Grand Final as Richmond versus AFL House because, well, since their introduction in the 2012 season, the GWS, they've had a little bit of help from the, the AFL Gold Chest. So I'm definitely, as a proud AFL traditionalist, I'm going for Richmond uh, tomorrow. I'll have a final word about uh, what I think is going to happen uh, tomorrow at the end of the show. Now, we are broadcasting live on the, the Tim Wilms uh, YouTube channel, as usual. And for the first time tonight, we are rebroadcasting through Entropy, which if you're a regular viewer of XYZ Live and The Uncuckables, you will know is an enhanced uh, YouTube broadcasting software. It allows you to ask questions of myself. I will be having a Q&A after this program, uh, just as a special uh, Friday night experiment and you can also participate in polls if I want to ask a question uh, during the the show you can go over to Entropy and answer the poll uh, but the best thing about Entropy is that you can send me super chats so this gets around uh, YouTube's requirements that you have uh, 1k subscribers uh, to be monetized on YouTube and not only that, but Entropy takes less of a cut than YouTube, so everyone's a winner. So I've already posted the, the Entropy link in the, the pre-show. I will post it again throughout the show. It's a little bit more complicated to manage everything uh, doing just this solo show because with the Uncuckables, I'm always able to bas uh, basically defer to somebody else while I do some of the, the technical stuff. But it's one man operation here, so I'm juggling it all here, but that's been part of the fun here. All right, and of course, there is still the, the YouTube live chat, which you can participate in just as before and share your reactions. Now, it's the, the week's end, and there's a lot of news that I want to have my say on. Now, first thing is the, the Trump uh, impeachment, <laughs> which is, I, I know that the, there's a mock uh, Ben and Jerry uh, flavor called impeachment, uh, which apparently comes with uh, tiny hands and it tastes really orange but they made one for barack obama previously you know those stupid ben and jerry flavors they're they're made by two bernie sanders supporters ben and jerry everyone thinks that they're <laughs> a gay couple but i digress so the impeachment proceedings against uh, president donald trump were launched by congressional democrats now this was all triggered by an anonymous whistleblower who we only know at this stage is a cia officer who believed based on conversations he'd had with other colleagues in the CIA and within the government that President Trump's conversation with new Ukrainian president uh, Volodymyr uh, Zelensky, I think I pronounced that right, I haven't got Dave Hiscock here to, 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 to get me to pronounce things properly, but that's my best go. Now, he had just been sworn in to the job as Ukrainian president. He had previously been a television comedian and impersonated the Ukrainian president uh, on television. So Ukraine is, is taking a leaf out of well, the US book and uh, electing a, a TV personality. Well, Ukraine, they've had political crisis after political crisis over the past 20 years, so why the hell not? So at first, this whistleblower's complaint alleged that uh, Trump was encouraging foreign interference in the, the United States 2020 election. Uh, it was alleged that Trump uh, threatened to withhold uh, US foreign aid to Ukraine, which they used to hold off Russia 
unless they reopened an investigation into Hunter Biden, uh, who is the son of Joe Biden, uh, while he was working in Ukraine uh, for a company, uh, Burisma Holdings. Uh, they were alleged to have engaged in money laundering, tax evasion, and corruption. This alleged corruption by Hunter Biden occurred while his father was vice president of the United States, and the general prosecutor who was investigating this case, uh, Victor Shokin, was fired at the behest of Joe Biden and other international uh, politicians. It's alleged that he wasn't doing enough for uh, to crack down on Ukraine's own corruption. There's actually tape Trump posted on his Twitter account that uh, he urged that this prosecutor be fired and bragged about that he got the prosecutor fired. So Joe Biden was pretty pleased with that. So first, congressional Democrats demanded that the transcript be released by the White House, and Trump said fine, and he classified the, the transcript. This was early Wednesday morning America time, and all Trump said was that uh, people... All Trump, sorry, I'll start again. All Trump said on that phone call was that people were talking about Hunter Biden and this alleged corruption and that it was worth looking into. There was no threats of withholding military aid, prid quo, or coded signaling, which would be grounds for impeachment. Uh, now, I know that Trump's critics have said, oh, this is not a word-for-word -word transcript. It's notes uh, compiled by the uh, intelligence office, uh, 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 alleging that, uh, that it somehow they omitted uh, crucial detail that would be the the smoking gun now this whistleblower has it's it's gone from now that there, there was alleged uh, abuse of power by uh, trump uh, on this phone call with the ukrainian uh, president uh, so so what's happened now is that it's gone from an abuse of power allegation against Trump to his administration didn't handle the whistleblower complaint about this secret conversation, which is now being public in the completely correct manner. Because the the allegation that the whistleblower is making that this phone call, like all oh, communications between the president and other world leaders are highly classified, but the complainant said that this was too highly classified that it looked like they'd had something to hide, which the revelation has released. The, the transcript being being released is that there there, there was no uh, explosive things in it. And so he's saying that the fact that they kept it secret, even though there was actually nothing ex explosive in the end, it was a nothing burger, that uh, that's the scandal now. And... Uh, because uh, his whistleblower complaint was not forwarded to congressional intelligence committees within seven day period. So as I said, he's now being impeached. The Democrats haven't said that oh, we're, because they announced the impeachment before the transcript was released. And so what, uh, what they're basing the impeachment now on is that uh, Trump's administration, they didn't follow all the proper procedures in forwarding this whistleblower complaint, which in the end was a frivolous complaint. Now, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, she's 77. Uh, she, she's been resisting repeated calls from her progressive uh, Democrat congressional factions led by the squad, uh, which Trump calls AOC plus three. Uh, they've, they've wanted to impeach Trump for heaps of things uh, I, I, over the term of his, his presidency. They thought the, the, the Mueller investigation was going to be the smoking gun, but uh, Mueller uh, didn't find any collusion and he gave that <laughs> ba basically forgetful testimony before uh, Congress. And so Pelosi, she's obviously she's a progressive, but she's also a skilled political operative. She knew that you only call for impeachment if there there is a, abuse of power and corruption. She didn't want her party to be seen as the boy who cried wolf. But now they are because she capitulated to these radical Democrats and basically it shows uh, how she has lost control of her party, which is uh, it just shows how much the, the Democrat party has disintegrated because everyone made fun of the fact that the, the Democrat candidates, uh, the viable ones are all really old, but as I've made the point repeatedly, uh, that's because the, the next generation, uh, they uh, they are completely barking mad. And so that's why you've got the three leaders, Joe Biden. And this is the real story here, that the, the media and the politicians should be focusing on the alleged abuse of power of Joe Biden as vice president, who's now campaigning to be the president, to basically protect his son, Hunter Biden, and th through all 
accounts is, is only a successful businessman because of his uh, father. And impeachment proceedings against Trump, I think Pelosi secretly knows this, and so does Trump and the, the Republicans, as likely to increase his popularity in the lead up to the 2020 election. Uh, just like it did for Bill Clinton when there was the Republicans attempted to impeach him uh, in 1998 and in the, the midterm elections later that, that year, the Democrats made gains. So it completely backfired. All right, now to the other uh, political shit show across the Atlantic, and that is, is Brexit. So the Remainers in the UK are now acting in completely disjointed and contradictory manners to stop Boris Johnson achieving Brexit, deal or no deal, uh, by October 31st. They, they, he's, he was betrayed, uh, stabbed in the back by 21 of his uh, conservative MPs who've now been expelled uh, from the party. So he doesn't have a majority. And so he said, let's have an election. But they know that the Remain party is they're going to lose. And so they're, they're not allowing him to call the election, even though he doesn't basically there is no confidence on the on the floor of the house of commons and so the the parliament is now completely uh, dysfunctional and so they've passed legislation to make no deal brexit illegal and now they want to pass another law uh, to to make it so that boris johnson he has to seek an extent extension until so january 30 i believe is the a date. And of course, they were saying it was such a humiliation for, for Boris Johnson with the Supreme Court unanimously, unanimously all 11 judges uh, deciding that it was unlawful for him to prolong Parliament, uh, basically saying that he lied to the Queen because the Queen has the ultimate power to do this. They basically overrid the, the, the Queen because the High Court, the, the lower court said, we have no standing to deal with this political matter. But the Supreme Court said, no, uh, this is unprecedented. Our democracy is uh, not functioning. And so they basically either said that the, the Queen is, is stupid and she's ignorant and that it was so easy for, for Boris Johnson uh, to mislead her. So <laughs> there you go. Things... No, people, people think that U.S. politics has, has gotten insane, but well, it, it's basically the political establishment, the the, the MPs, are, ba are basically they've delayed the the will of the people for three years because it was in June 2016 that they they voted to leave the the European Union, and they're trying any means necessary, any anti-democratic, any people anti-people's measure to try and stop Brexit. The Liberal Democrats, they passed a motion at their conference to cancel uh, Brexit. So they're, they're pretty clear that they're going to ignore the people and they're, they're going to, because there's been talk of a people's vote on the final uh, deal that is uh, negotiated to, to leave the European Union, which still has to pass the, the House of Commons, so a second people's vote. So even if there is a second referendum to approve the, the deal negotiated, it would still have to pass the House of Commons and they could still not vote for it. That's how absurd this situation is because, again, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom said that uh, the the government, the, the, the deal negotiated with the European Union, it had to uh, pass the, the parliament. So we've had massive interference from the, the courts in the, the UK to thwart uh, Brexit as well. So it is it is just a mess. And Boris Johnson is doing an absolutely noble job in basically risking his whole political career because he is a career politician. He's, he comes from a political family on achieving Brexit. He said, I'd rather die in a ditch than delay Brexit. And there's already been calls for him to resign uh, another leadership election. So he is showing dedication to the, the British people. And I he, he is one of the bravest politicians, I think, we've seen in the world. I've just posted the entropy link again in the chat. So make sure you come on, come on over there uh, because I'll be doing a poll question then. And as I said, uh, there'll be Q and A at the end of this show. All right. So another back locally, there is the big political development was that uh, abortion has now been uh, decriminalized in New South Wales, which means it's no longer uh, in the the Crimes Act, so there was a, a number of amendments that that passed the the upper house to basically uh, pr 
water it down so that it's very difficult to uh, abort babies the day before birth, which was what the original Alex Greenrich private members bill uh, proposed. And there was uh, Liberal MPs, uh, Tanya Davies and Kevin Connolly, they threatened to quit the Liberal Party unless uh, key amendments were, were met. And Tanya Davies, along with Lou Amato and Matthew uh, Mason Cox, they, they called a, a leadership spill uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, because uh, Gladys Berejiklian, and she had sprung this on the New South Wales public, done a deal with Alex Renrich, Labor, Nationals, Greens, everyone, uh, to, uh, uh, to basically fast track this radical abortion bill through the parliament and to the New South Wales right to life uh, lobby's credit, even though they were caught off guard, uh, these legislations had been steamrolled uh, throughout other states of Australia, they mobilised and they, they managed to uh, they managed to get two, hold two pro-life rallies, uh, one outside the parliament, and then a, another one which uh, on a Sunday, which got uh, 10,000 people. Uh, so I'm just going to, uh, because one of the Christian uh, news websites, uh, which uh, Tanya Davies, she's written a thank you letter to uh, pro-life advocates in New South Wales. I'll just go through it here. Pro-life maverick, MP Tanya Davies thanks her supporters. She says, you may have heard the abortion law reform passed. Many people expressed their concern and alarm at the content of the original bill. Despite this bill being fast-tracked through the parliament without proper public consultation and a parliamentary inquiry, supporters like yourself quickly rallied. With 48 hours, we had 13,000 people lodge submissions to a rush five-day parliamentary inquiry and over 100,000 people signed the petition. Although we denied proper consultation, this overwhelming community engagement was itself a significant achievement, especially when animal cruelty was granted five months to inquiry. So there was a total of 102 amendments that were moved in the upper house over 30 hours de of debate. And apparently this was a record, or it was the third longest debate in the history of the New South Wales Legislative Council, which has been in existence since 1824. And so uh, Tanya Davies goes through the uh, concessions that were, were given to her and the, the other uh, brave uh, uh, pro-life pro uh, Liberal MPs. So this was, here we go, number two, the medical practitioner may perform the intermination on the person only if the medical practitioner has obtained informed consent prior to the termination. Without limited to subsection three, medical practitioner may ask for advice about the proposed termination from a multidisciplinary team advisory committee. This section is intended to reflect the, the common law position on terminations at the time this act were, was enacted, subject to purposes and requirements. So this basically, uh, there are still significant restrictions on abortions after 22 weeks, as there was uh, in the, the common law provisions beforehand. So that is a big win that it can't just be two doctors that, that rubber, rubber stamp a, a late term abortion. Before performing a termination, a specialist medical practitioner must perform all necessary information to the person about access to counselling, including publicly funded counselling. Practitioner gives the person information approved, Secretary of Health. So that's more information, basically an informed uh, decision. That, uh, that was one of the key key demands of the, the pro-life advocates, that a woman be informed of her options and that she wasn't being coerced. This section applies if a termination results if a person is born, prevents the medical practitioner who performed the termination from exercising any duty to provide the person with medical care and treatment that is clinically safe to the person's medical condition, also known as the baby born alive amendment. So they can't be killed, basically. Medical practitioner who performs the termination much within 28 days after performing the termination, give the information. This parliament opposes the performance of terminations for the purpose of sex selection. It doesn't actually make it illegal, though. The report must include recommendations about how to, how to prevent terminations being performed for the purpose of sex selections. To avoid any... Number 25, to avoid any doubt for the purpose of subsection 1, a person who uses intimidation or coerce a person to have a termination performed, including the purpose of the sex selection, is to have used intimidation to compel the person to have the termination. The person that uses that uh, is liable for conviction before the local court to imprisonment of two years or a fine of 50 penalty units or both. So, Tanya Davies, she's trying to see the, the bright side uh, here that 
uh, they, these were significant victories and I know that, well, I'm 100% pro-life and so it still is overall a sad day in, in New South Wales and Australia that now it's slightly easier to seek a termination, uh, an abortion in, in New South Wales. You have to put this in perspective that unlike in the other states where it was steamrolled through uh, these radical abortion laws, there was a reaction in New South Wales. There was a, a spill motion moved against Gladys Berejiklian, which I didn't approve of at the time, but it worked. I mean, these extreme political tactics by Tanya Davies and, and her liberal uh, pro-life colleagues, they, uh, they worked. And we now have a, a slightly uh, less barbaric abortion law in, in New South Wales. And the activism that uh, was launched in, in New South Wales that, that sprung up, uh, New South Wales Right to Life did an outstanding job, which is led by Dr. Rachel Carling Jenkins. She's a former Victorian uh, state MLC. Uh, she unsuccessfully during her time in the Victorian Parliament uh, tried to move the Infant Viability Act, which would prevent late-term abortions in Victoria. She's taken the lessons from her time in the Victorian Parliament in, in well, unsuccessfully trying to overturn Victoria's horrid abortion laws and taken that to New South Wales. And she's, she's achieved a lot in terms of ma making sure that there is some protection for human life uh, in the, the state's abortion laws. And like, like I said, this should inspire other pro-life act activists all around the country that they can uh, reform uh, their radical abortion laws. And the annual March for the Babies, which takes place in, in Melbourne, uh, goes from uh, Treasury Gardens up to uh, Victoria State Parliament House. That is on Saturday, uh, 12th of October at, at 1 p.m. Uh, it is led by uh, Bernie Finn, a liberal MLC, probably the most pro-life uh, member in the, the parliament. It's held on the anniversary every year of the 2008 Victorian Abortion Law Reform Bill, which legalised abortion until birth. Uh, so this is the 10th anniversary. I've been to many of the previous ones. It's always been a sombre uh, occasion. I've been qu uh, quite demoralised as a pro-life advocate, uh, but uh, this year I think there'll, there'll be uh, some optimism and positivity in the air because of what was achieved in, in New South Wales. So uh, the Unshackled is going to, to cover it throughout the day. There is a planned uh, protest by the Socialist Alternative and the, the Reason Party. They'll obviously attempt to uh, disrupt uh, things, but this is a new beginning for the pro-life uh, advocate, advocates in Australia. Now, I'm just going to play, uh, because it wasn't just the, the Liberal pro-life MPs who helped uh, reform, amend this bill. It was also Mark Latham, who is the, the New South Wales One Nation uh, leader. I'm just going to play Mark Latham's uh, chat with, with Pauline Hanson, which was after the uh, abortion bill was passed. Uh, Obviously, once it passed the Legislative Council, this was 26 votes to 14. It went back to the Legislative Assembly so they could approve the amendments, and then it's going to get royal assent. So I'll just play uh, Mark Latham's conversation with Pauline Hanson. We've been talking about for weeks on end, eating up uh, scores of hours of debating abortion. time, an abortion bill in a state where we had. Uh, permissible lawful abortions for 50 years and the police have an instruction not to do any prosecution. So for the sake of lefty symbolism that won't change anything in real life, we've ignored all the big issues and Labor, Liberal and the National Party have been totally absorbed with something that was more about what they feel on the issue than the public need. I agree. People are disgusted with it. I spent so much time in the Parliament debating this whole issue and it was really wasn't very ridiculous. Um, you know, it was a promise given at the last election. So it was a Greens bill. It wasn't a Greens bill. She went yeah, along. Yeah, it was with a it. lower house independent and the Greens and the left wing National and Liberal Party people. But Gladys Berejiklian allocated dozens of hours of debate. I mean, this has been going on for weeks and weeks. And that can't happen unless the government says Parliament drops all other business, the drought, energy, congestion in the city, yeah. and just debates this one issue. Okay. So it's been a real misallocation of parliamentary resources. Just tell some of the people out there what was in the bill, okay, about this. Um, what, at what time can you have an abortion up to? Well, you can have it up to the day of birth, really, the day before birth. Um, we had an amendment to ban it after uh, 20 weeks. 
unless it's a life-threatening situation. Uh, the government came back with a watered-down amendment to say it's got to be in a public hospital. But it's true that for a social reason, so that could be someone lost their job or their relationship broke up, they can have an abortion. And, and I think that's way out of step with community values because if you see a heavily pregnant woman walking down the street, you think there's a baby in there, a human life, that's about to be born. And this bill is all about the left-wing agenda that the woman's right to choose overrides every other consideration, even normal public standards. I totally dis disagree with that. I believe um, abortion is for rights of, of health reasons for the mother or, or the child or rape, or if there has been a rape, but up to a certain period of time, um, up to the day before, so wrong. No, that no, is, it that is, is wrong. Is, it is it so is wrong. wrong. Tell me another thing, what they put in this about a man can have an abortion? Well, <laughs> I mean, the world's gone nuts, hasn't it? They say... We, we tried to move an amendment to say that the bill should talk about women because at the moment, and as it's passed by the lower house, the Act will only talk about a person having an abortion. And the crazy green left-wing argument is that um, uh, uh, someone identifying as a man can have a womb. Now, this is all from outer space, of course, <laughs> madness. Only a woman biologically can have a baby. Only right. a woman biologically can have a termination. So we lost that 2318. And incredibly, all six National Party people in the upper house voted for the proposition a man can have a baby. Go figure. It, it is. It is go figure. Um, do you think one of them might want to have a baby? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> they might have that. Let's, let's see what Am happens ambition. in the future. Maybe there's a few secret but wombs in the uh, male fraternity in the National Party. But no wonder Barnaby Joyce is screaming about it because these people are way... way to the extreme of politics. They're not social conservatives anymore. That's why we need the balance. One nation there, common sense um, policies, talking to people and raising the issues. So, so, you know, you've done a great job. People are very proud of what you've done. Well, I hope so. There's other things And that's what I'm hearing. Another feedback. big issue was, uh, you know... Uh, all right, that was Mark Latham talking with uh, Pauline Hanson there, and oh yeah, <laughs> that was a doozy there that the amendment to identify what that... Uh, uh, pre pregnant women define in the act that it's women that get pregnant that was rejected because men can get pregnant well trans men can who were once women like uh, you uh, because this was actually a it's a court case in the the united kingdom where a trans man is trying to be listed as the the father yes you might be a man now but you're still the the mother because you gave birth it was your egg that created the the baby now we've got our first uh, super chat here. Uh, it's from Port Film Co-op. It's for three uh, US dollars. It says to be sung with vigor. Come and feel the steel, 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 steel. Come and feel the steel, 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 steel. Oh, oh, steel, steely, steel, oh, steel. Now Port Film Co-op, uh, he's quite active in the <laughs> in the in the in the live chat because. Uh, he's been a long-time subscriber to the Unshackled main channel. And he's used to uh, Steel Archer's uh, editor-at-large and host of Detonation. His, oh, it was almost daily, his uh, Detonation program. He's had a wide variety of guests to begin with, but his focus at the moment is the, the Transhumanist Party presidential elections. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that's the focus of Detonation at the moment. He's been holding three six-hour debates, and so that's a bit of a, a joke by, by Fort Film uh, Co-op. Uh, if I'm on the air, then, then where is Steel? Well, Steel was just on the air before with a Detonation uh, episode, so I've just taken the, the studio seat. Uh, Steel is just he's, he's over in the, the, the workstation uh, with me at the moment. So maybe you can hear some of this, but he, he's aware of the, the, the in-joke in the, in the comments. But, you know, Steel, I think, you know, he's, I think everyone agrees sort of needs to lighten up time to time. And Paul Film Carp has asked a question, uh, where the fudge is Steel? Yes, he's, he, he's not far from me, I can guarantee you. All right. Now, on to more news. So, this broke uh, late last night, this story, which is uh, the Anti-Defamation League, which is the, the, the US uh, anti-hate speech lobby group. It's, it's mainly about fighting anti-Semitism. It's a, it's a Jewish group. So it talks here, uh, burning swastika, happy merchant, and roof bowl cut amongst new symbols on extremist 
watch list. Now, if we go down here, it talks about the, the OK hand symbol. You're all familiar with that. Began as a hoax by members of the, the website 4chan. The OK became a popular trolling tactic. By 2019, the symbol has been used in some circles as sincere expressions of white supremacy. Australian white supremacist Brenton Tarrant flashed the symbol during his March 2019 courtroom appearance soon after his arrest for allegedly murdering 50 people in mosques in Christchurch. Burning neo-Nazi symbols. Uh, Neo-Nazis have adopted the Ku Klux Klan practice of symbolically burning, substituting swastikas and other neo-Nazi symbols. I've never heard of that. I've... Can anyone enlighten me in the comments? Is that actually... <laughs> happened. Uh, Dylan Roof's uh, bowl cut. Uh, now, he was the the, the, the mass uh, killer at the AMC church in Charleston, South Carolina, where he uh, shot dead nine African-American ch churchgoers. So, uh, the bowl cut is an image of the, the bowl-shaped haircut uh, resembling the one worn by white supremacist mass killer uh, Dylan Roof. So, if you show an image of the bowl cut, uh, that's a, a hate symbol. Happy Merchant, an anti-Semitic meme depicting the drawing of a Jewish man with heavily stereotyped facial features who is, who is greedily rubbing his hands together. The meme is by far the most popular anti-Semitic meme among white supremacists. This one, Adua Shoa, anti-Semitic phrase that became popular amongst white supremacists to mock Jews whom they claim to bring up the Holocaust when confronted with anything they don't like. Uh, diversity equaling white genocide, a white supremacist slogan intended to suggest multiculturalism will mean the demise of the, the white race. Uh, logos of various hate groups, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so even though the ADL, it's a... It's just an independent lobby group. Apparently, if they decide something, uh, a hate symbol now, it's basically globalist law. So... I'm not going to take my cues from the the ADL. I've 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 flashed the the OK sign on other streams, and I'll do it tonight. Not because I'm a white supremacist. Everyone knows that I'm not, but basically because nobody is going to tell me what I can and can't do with, with with my hand. I mean, this basically it still is a troll. It's basically to to symbolise that uh, I. I'm not going to counter to your basic definitions of what is what is hate speech and let you basically decide what I am based on flashing this. So this is basically a, a fuck you that I well I have you know you're you're not going to label me a white supremacist, but you know you're not going to make me stop stop doing this because this is basically that I support free speech and I'm not going to let you bully me around. So there you go. That's my statement for tonight. Uh, now you know who's who's also outraged about hate in Western Western countries, and that is uh, Saudi Arabia, because it wasn't just uh, Greta Thunberg who who made the speech to the United Nations this week. There was the the United Nations General Assembly uh, that was uh, sitting, and so uh, Saudi Arabia is on the, the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council, and so they have accused uh, Australia of racism and extraordinary UN broadside uh, because they, they wanted to move Australia led a coalition of countries condemning Saudi Arabia over a raft of human rights abuses, arbitrary detention, torture, enforced disappearance, and the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, who was the uh, Saudi Arabian journalist murdered at the Emb Saudi Arabian embassy in Turkey. And so, if we go down here, the Saudi ambassador Abdul Aziz. Al Asawi launched an extraordinary broadside targeting Australia. He said minorities, migrants, Muslims face horrific violations of human rights, racist and extremist policies. Unfortunately, these have become more popular and even accepted by some Western parliaments and they're even sponsored by certain governments. We see in some countries radicalization against Muslims. We see xenophobia and racism and some governments sympathize with them like Australia. He referred to the massacre perpetrated by Brenton Tarrant, an Australian which was based on hate speech. And Australia's he condemned Australia's speech at the, the UN Human Rights Council as uh, ill-informed. We have listened to, with great surprise to the statement of Australia on behalf of a group of states. There are many mistakes, misleading information. The kinder continues to reform its policies in accordance with the values of Islamic teaching, especially with regard to the rights of, of women. Wow, progress, because women can now drive now. They can uh, go out without a female escort. Wow, progress. But I know that this is a, a topic of discussion 
uh, in these live streams that uh, Islam is right about women. We talked about this on the Uncuckables last night. I don't agree. I believe that women are entitled to the same uh, rights as men. They're not entitled to more rights. Their, uh, wor their words and actions are not entitled to more respect than men because that is not uh, proper gender equality. All right, I've spoken for nearly half an hour now, or oh, over half an hour now, getting the news out to you. So now it's finally time for the, the meat of the show. And the title of the show is uh, Jolly Old Socialist, which refers to uh, the downfall of uh, veteran uh, socialist activist uh, Stephen Jolly, who is a Yarra City councillor. Uh, he has been, or he's resigned, being forced out of the a Victorian Socialist political party. Uh, now, I will confess, even though I've promoted this as a live show, this is it's pre-recorded because uh, Lucas Rosas, who uh, who I'm going to bring on uh, in a moment, uh, he uh, is is busy with a lot of work and family commitments, and so I can't get him live on the show. I can only get him on the phone. But the the chat is is certainly something that needed to be recorded at some point and i will broadcast uh, to you now this is will's front brought to you by the unshackled.net now i'm going to bring in tonight as our guest uh, the unshackled's associate editor lucas roses i call him and our Antifa hitman. Uh, he's been following uh, Marxist, uh, left-wing, extremist, anarchist uh, groups, not just in, in the past five years, but over many decades. So obviously what's happened with uh, Stephen Jolly being forced out of the Victorian uh, socialist, uh, he can give us a complete rundown on Stephen Jolly's history and, of course, the events that uh, have brought uh, his uh, Victorian socialist experiment uh, to an end. And we're also going to uh, ask him about a few other uh, left-wing extremist uh, developments. So, Lucas, great to talk to you again. Fantastic to be back, Tim, and congratulations on the new format. It's looking fantastic so far. Yes, thank you. I've really enjoyed uh, the, uh, doing Wilmsfront uh, so far, this live, fast-paced uh, format. I'm covering news uh, as it breaks, and obviously uh, what's happened with Stephen Jolly, it broke on, on Monday night. They The Age jumped it on, on Brownlow night. I don't know if Jolly was, was watching the Brownlow, because I know he's a, he's a big footy fan, and he got the, the Yarra Council back in 2017 to support the, the Richmond Tigers in the grand final. Yeah, he's doing something similar about it today. Uh, which uh, this year with the Richmond being in the grand final this weekend as well, which is an interesting thing. It's always nice to see that people have more of a human side, even if they're human trash. <laughs> yeah. Well, Stephen Jolly, he's he he's an old school socialist, uh, to, uh, to put it that way. I mean, he is 57 years old, near near about. Uh, he's he's been around the the scene for decades, and and certainly we focus on uh, the young ones these days, the the radical anti-capitalist, the the feminist, the the LGBT one. But Jolly is actually he he has a lived experience as a as a working class man. He's he's raised a, a family. He's basically what old labour used to be. Oh, more like what old extreme left used to be. I mean, even even by the standards of old Labor, he would still be on the extreme left. I mean, he has been a Trotskyist for his entire adult life, and he's been an activist for his entire adult life. I mean, we can go a little bit into his history right now, if that's okay with you. Yeah, well, uh, let's go back right to when he was born. He was uh, born in, in London to an Irish uh, single uh, mother, and uh, so... That, that's where his life began and uh, obviously his his mother was a, an unwed uh, Irish Catholic and so he already had faced from that young age uh, s some form of oppression from a hierarchical authority. Yeah, and the more the fact that when he was born, uh, as was not a particularly uncommon thing at the time, if you go back that far, uh, his grandma, he was told that his grandmother was his mother and that his mother was his sister. And his uh, mother was fairly quickly bundled away and uh, he didn't find out the truth until he was in his teenage years. And at that stage he followed his mother to South Africa where she had moved and he actually finished his schooling and his uh, university 
he did his university degree in uh, the University of Cape Town under apartheid South Africa, which is a very interesting sort of thing there, just sort of his formative years. Right? An Irish guy who was born in London and finished his education in South Africa. And he certainly wasn't sort of, even though he came from a very traditional working class, sort of living in a house estate background, uh, that wasn't really sort of the experience of his formative years. And when he'd finished his schooling, he came back to Ireland and, um, look, you were talking about the fact that he's an old style socialist, an old style Trotskyist in that sort of, uh, that tradition. And that's a hundred percent true. He was part of, in Ireland, the, the militant group, what was called the militant tendency. People who are older listeners might actually remember them from the 1980s. They were the ones who were causing so much trouble in and around Liverpool at the time. They actually tried to, they were almost at the point of um, they, uh, attempting to take over the Labour Party during the Thatcher years. There was some of the huge sort of splits and internal fighting that they caused, which helped Thatcher to stay in power for as long as she did, because they had just so many activists. They'd completely taken over the, um, the youth uh, wing of the British Labour Party back in the 1970s. And they like, continued that hold over it until the late 80s, early 90s, when they all decided to leave. But um, so Jolly was in the Irish wing of that, which was attempting to do the same thing in Ireland with less success. And um, that in the middle of the early to sort of early to mid 1980s, they started sending missionaries overseas to uh, colonise socialist parties and that sort of stuff um, in different countries. And they had some success of this, the militant tendency. Like in uh, Sri Lanka, they managed to pretty much um, sort of affiliate the largest sort of extreme left party in Sri Lanka to themselves. Uh, they also, in Sweden, they got kicked out. In a lot of countries, they got kicked out because they'd seen the experience of how much trouble the British Labour Party was having and they saw them coming a mile away. And in Australia, they managed to, when Stephen showed up here, they managed to take over a few Labour Party branches. And they, uh, but they didn't have a huge amount of success because they only had a limited amount of activists here. And when Stephen first came here, he was in Sydney. Um, in between coming to Australia, he'd uh, gone back to Africa. Supposedly, he was a part of the underground resistance against Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Um, he'd uh, ducked in between coming up to Australia. He'd ducked up to um, China for the Tiananmen Square protests, where he supposedly gave a speech to the Tiananmen uh, to the protesters at Tiananmen Square, which I always say must have been a wonderful speech since. Almost none of them would have spoken English, and he speaks no dialect of Chinese. So it would have been a really interesting speech. I'm sure they got a lot out of it before the tanks rolled in. And um, he, then he comes back to uh, Sydney again. And then when Jeff Kennett was elected in Victoria, the Liberal Premier, he moved down to Victoria, along with a lot of other sort of Marxist groups who had been butting there. This was around the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. A lot of Trotskyists were starting to get a bit desperate. They were banging their heads against a brick wall a little bit. They thought with the fall of Stalinism that their time had come, but things were moving sort of in more, like at that time, more of Francis Fukuyama end of history sort of thing. That's where the culture was more heading. So they really uh, sort of thought that maybe this was their time and they were trying to grasp onto it with both hands. And there was a lot of... Uh, problems inside most of the Marxist groups at that time. But uh, Jolly came down to Melbourne and um, there was a, they were attempting to uh, sort of restructure the um, Victorian um, school system, which involved amalgamating a lot of schools. And this was very unpopular with a lot of parents. And Jolly tried to jump in on one such protest movement against this in Fitzroy and the local Labor Party said, uh, we know you, you're a Trotskyist, get out. So he moved into another one down in Richmond, which became a bit famous because they actually occupied the school when it was closed and kept it running by bringing in teachers with far-left sympathies and paying them the dole as a wage. And um, they actually managed to keep the school running for most of a year, which was a gargantuan effort. It was a really, like, uh, a huge sort of and very impressive a. Uh, efforts and feats of organisation, and it was jolly behind most of it. And the fact that, unlike most Trotskyist groups, he was actually able, through necessity, because he didn't have a huge activist network, to make links with local communities. He was actually able to dig sort of down into that local community that he'd only just moved to, and actually make sort of friendships and 
organise ordinary people in the area, which is something that Trotskyist groups in Australia, who are typically made up of university students with their heads in the clouds, uh, traditionally have a great deal of trouble doing. Uh, um, the police eventually moved in to force Jolly out, and um, the protesters had a very well organised legal defence and managed to get a lot of money from the state government later through the ombudsman because the police just came in and beat the crap out of them. And there were a lot of other extremists that Jolly had managed to organise and pull in there. This is just a pattern that you see throughout this guy's life. He pulls people together. Like later on, he was involved in the uh, Save Albert Park thing, but the Labour Party again had already taken under John Brumby who was then a minister, I believe, um, had taken over the Save Albert Park thing and sort of putting it in their own direction. He wasn't able to do much there. But then the protest against Pauline Hanson came along and he was very much involved in organising buses full of thugs to go down to protests in Dandenong where the, the famous image of the guy who was simply coming along to have a look and getting completely smashed by anarchists and being laid out on the ground convulsing with uh, foam coming out of his mouth after being attacked by people who were spitting on him and surrounding him. Uh, it's, uh, it's these sorts of things that have been slipped down the memory hole a bit when people start, particularly journalists, start talking about how wonderful the, the far left is by fighting fascism. Uh, it's sort of just how they manage to keep... They, they, uh, most of the groups involved, like Socialist Alternative and that sort of stuff, they still um, congratulate themselves to this day by violently forcing Pauline Hanson out of Melbourne. They consider themselves to have been the main force in stopping her the first time, in their view. Yeah. And um, but, yeah, it's um, so Jolly was involved in. He was on a with Kerry Ann Kennelly and David Oldfield on a, a very interesting um, thing. I haven't been able to find the video of it, where that the transcript is up online, where David Oldfield's pretty much just saying, "You're organising groups of thugs to go and attack political meetings, people you disagree with. How can you say that's possibly a good thing?" And Jolly's rambling for a while trying to justify it. And um, then he went on, he helped to be a major force organising the S11 riots in 2000 around Crown Casino. That was a globalisation conference. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the globalisation conference, back when left-wingers were actually against globalism. <laughs> it uh, wasn't, wasn't that long ago. It's, it's, it's a bit weird uh, to think about it these days, actually. And, uh, yeah, he then went on and became a, a very successful counsellor in Yarra because he, in the same thing like with the Richmond High School thing, unlike most far-left extremists, he went from house to house, talked with people, listened to their problems, and did this every day after work, after he finished work. He's worked in construction and in various other things along the way. And, um, and of course, been a union rep and was uh, affiliated with the CFMEU back when they were CFMEU rather than CFMMMMMMMEU, whatever they are now. And uh, he actually managed to get a seat because of the proportional representation in the city of Yarra in the seat, I think it's around Collingwood, where his seat is. So you, you get three people elected. So he managed to get elected on only about 9% of the vote. And, uh, but he has increased his vote every time since then because unlike the local Labor and Greens councillors, he works his ass off. Right? He has a small, he had a small group and had a small group ever since the Richmond High School thing of about 10 to 20 people around him who are all a part of his particular group and they are all fanatically dedicated to their cause and they um, helped to build up this local base of people who knew Stephen Jolly in and around this area and who knew his face and who, even if they didn't like him, knew him. And as a result of that, his vote has climbed in nearly every election since. And he's managed to maintain that seat, something that socialists are traditionally not very good at, even when they do manage to get seats. And um, what has happened since then, uh, the big one for him was he used this base that he made in Yarra Council to organise almost pretty much off his own bat. The, the Greens helped a bit, but it was mostly him and his group. The uh, East-West Project um, blockades, right, where they managed to cause so much trouble for the East-West Link Project, which was a major road project that was proposed for Melbourne, which would have seriously helped the congestion in Melbourne, but would have gone through the sort of inner city hipster area where uh, Stephen Jolly had his power base that um, when Daniel Andrews took over, he cancelled the project, which cost a billion dollars to the Victorian taxpayers. It was such a huge win for him that it gained him so much 
kudos, a gigantic amount of kudos amongst the extreme left, that this guy who's pretty much got 20, 25 people in his group had managed to shut down a billion-dollar sort of uh, project. Yeah, and, and Daniel just Andrews, he wore the uh, political fallout from that from the beginning of his time as Premier. That's right. And um, Stephen Jolly pretty much got all the positives, and Daniel Andrews got the negatives. Mm. <laughs> it was just such a huge win for him, particularly around the activists at the far left. So when the Reclaim Australia movement happened in 2015, uh, he was at the forefront, just simply from the prestige gain from the East West Project, at uh, organising against it. So the big uh, April 5th, I think it was, Reclaim Australia rally in Federation Square, he organised all the various different Marxist and anarchist groups to organise people to come and attack the Reclaim Australia people. And it was um, a success. They managed to get at least equal numbers to the Reclaim Australia people and they attacked them and split up their protests with the um, help of the police who didn't do a lot to stop them. Well, there, and, if you, if you, um, even, like, I remember that a bystander got uh, thrown to the ground. And going back to, obviously, the, the 1996 uh, violent uh, rallies against uh, pa uh, Pauline Hanson, you have to remember 20-plus uh, years ago, this was the day... Uh, back in the day, there was only the, the 6 o'clock news which showed what had happened. There was no camera phones, there was no YouTube, no anything. And this is why, as you said, it's so difficult to get a hold of footage from the time, uh, TV sure. appearances. And so that's why it's such a, a distant memory. That's certainly true. No internet back then, no really ability to sort of keep track of what was going on. And, um, yeah, Stephen Jolly was organising buses back during the Pauline Hanson protest. The buses brought up in Carlton outside Trades Hall, and everyone who wanted to go and attack the Pauline Hanson meeting was welcome to come on board. So not just members of his own group, which even back then was only a couple of dozen people. Right? He's never had a huge group. He's always been an organiser. He's always been far more um, influential by organising on the ground, grassroots sort of stuff than actually by having a large group of activists himself, which came to a head after the Reclaim Australia rally stuff that we're talking about, where he started the No Room for Racism group, which was by his Socialist Party. Uh, that, were the, that was the front group for them. And um, that his Socialist Party split very soon after with uh, accusations of a cover-up over sexual assault claims in 2015. Don't know how much we want to go into that because if naming names might not be the best of ideas, but it certainly... Um, it was alleged that a protege of um, Stephen Jolly had been accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault and that the party, through their internal structures, because they never go to the police, they always do an internal inquiry, had um, covered it up, pretty much. And so Stephen Jolly and uh, about half the party left, which, considering that he'd spent about three decades building up that little party, was, would have been quite devastating for him. But, um, yeah, a little um, later on in um, 2018, so last year, uh, Stephen Jolly and a crikey journalist, whose name I don't know, I can't remember, um, went around to Socialist Alliance and Socialist Alternative, the two biggest Trotskyist groups in Melbourne, and said, we want to start an electoral front with Stephen Jolly at its head because he's the best-known elected socialist in Australia and see if we can get him into the upper house in this election that's coming up in 2018. And this was a, despite the fact that he just missed out on preferences from being elected to the upper house in the northern metropolitan area, it was a bit of a raging success. Uh, yeah, the got, time... even though Fiona Patton, uh, she was elected on preferences, well re-elected, uh, Victorian socialist with Stephen Jolly as the lead candidate got a higher primary vote. Yeah, it's about 3,000 more votes than her. And she only just managed to leapfrog them on preferences by doing a um, uh, by doing a deal with the preference whisperer guy, and that was, that was just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, t for a, like context, no full-out communist, which Stephen Jolly is, has been elected to a Australian state parliament since 1950, when Fred Patterson was voted out of existence after the Labor Party in Queensland gerrymandered his seat so that he wouldn't win. Uh, it was, yeah, it's an absolute, uh, and back then they had voluntary voting in Queensland state government as well. So it's just, yeah, it's a phenomenal achievement to have even got close, particularly since they probably in a fair election would have won. 
Uh, but uh, Fiona Patton and Darren Hinch and the Preference Whisperers got together and figured around. But more to the point, they managed to mobilise somewhere between six and 800 activists. Uh, yeah. Which if you went north of the Yarra in Melbourne, amazing. then you just saw Victorian Socialist posters plastered all yeah. around with Stephen Jolly's face. They door knocked um, suburbs in like the far north of the electorate, up around Broadmeadows, Meadow mm. Heights, Coolaroo, that sort of stuff. They door knocked heavily migrant, very poor suburbs that have not seen a politician door knocking around there or even a political party door knocking around there in 50 years. Uh, they they were able to mobilise so many young sort of idealistic socialists from the university campuses and get them out and actually doing something productive towards an electoral campaign, thus sort of radicalising them more, creating sort of social networks and social atmosphere. It was really a, a very successful campaign on their part. And um, it's just unfortunate for the rest of us that they didn't manage to succeed because it really would have taken them to a, a separate level and it would have sort of formalised Victorian socialists as an electoral front going forward. Because uh, I, and it's to Stephen Jolly's credit again, you could not get Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance to cooperate on anything, ever. They are rival groups who hate each other and always have ever since 1995 when Socialist Alternative was created and back then it was the DSP which eventually became the Socialist Alliance um, a little bit later. Uh, it's They've always been rival groups. The fact that he's able to get these rival groups to work together is phenomenal. It's an incredible thing. Yeah. The man is a, a good organiser, a good yeah. diplomat. You and I, uh, like really we, we both despise his his politics, but you've you've got to respect the man that you know over like ever since he came to Melbourne. And it was interesting that there was a a socialist and communist uh, invasion. Uh, in Victoria because Jeff Kennett became Premier, like he was called a, a fascist and a Nazi uh, at the time and it seemed back then that uh, there that, that was enough sort of socialist activists who like, yeah, we've got to, you know, smash the fasc in, in Kennett and of course, uh, Jolly, he's, you know, he, he, he hasn't been afraid to, to use uh, thuggish tactics but, you know, he works, he, he doesn't take a, a government, uh, well, a a, a government welfare or as a university uh, student he's a he's a construction worker works hard uh, every day and then at at night and on weekends works hard to to mobilize actual community support yeah he went up and door knocked the commission flats in collingwood uh, it went up and down all those stairs knocking on doors talking to people who could barely speak english and trying to get his message across to them night after night, week after week, with a small band of dedicated and motivated and disciplined activists. Uh, it's amazing. It just goes to show how much all the other political parties have fallen down into this sort of, let's get a sign bite on TV. <laughs> and it also shows just how pathetic all the other extreme left groups are, because all they ever manage to do is um, just continue their same old thing of, let's uh, recruit university students, get them all... Uh, riled up and have a protest in the CBD. <laughs> and they do that over and over again, have been doing it for 20 years. In some ways, uh, Stephen Jolly is the most dangerous sort of Marxist politician that's been in Australia for many decades. And so this is why I'm very happy that uh, he's just quit or been suspended and then quit from Victorian Socialists. Now, uh, according to the Victorian uh, Socialist uh, press release, it's, it's over a family violence allegation intervention order. Uh, but a lot of uh, people on who would be on our side have sort of said, like, we shouldn't really be like you know, accusing uh, you know Jolly and and going back to the 2015 uh, sexual misconduct. Uh, allegation because the socialists there they're the biggest believers in the like the me too uh phenomena and so by by sort of like because you did a previous article talking about he you know said he'd sent a text and um you know been been chatting up a, a, a lot of women that we shouldn't be using this sort of the the me too uh, argument or or political pull to to basically take down somebody we don't like because you know, basically, because uh, I've heard from a lot of people, like, you know, Jolly at the end of the day, he's still a man. And so, you know, we shouldn't be encouraging this believe women, me too, even if it does drag, like, a, uh, political rivals down. Do you get what, do you get what I mean? 
Yeah, I'm sure you've heard that from a lot of people. And I'm sure that plenty of people on the right have said that. And that is why the right continues to lose over and over and over again. It's like being in um, the First World War and saying, we're not going to use machine guns because machine guns are dishonourable and they're very nasty. And if we don't use machine guns, then the other side will stop using machine guns too. Uh, or poison gas or anything. Uh, it's the... You can't win by simply taking the moral high ground and refusing to fight back, particularly when the enemy throws you a gun. Uh, and particularly when the enemy starts shooting himself in the foot with his own gun as well. You don't go over and try and take his bullets away from him. Uh, this Stephen Jolly is a highly effective Marxist politician. Uh, he has managed to actually make roots in the community in a way that no other Marxist politi politician has managed to do in a long time. And in Melbourne, that's dangerous because the more these people get a foothold, the more resources they're able to accrue, the more public support they're able to get. Uh, they've got ex-ABC um, people uh, like Tom Ballard supporting them openly. Uh, they've got uh, ex-ABC radio people supporting them openly. Right? Uh, even got an endorsement from Noam Chomsky. Isn't that nice? Uh, they, this organisation of Victorian Socialists was probably the most effective grouping together an alliance of um, extreme left groups in Melbourne since, well, a long time. Right, more effective than the Socialist Alliance was back when they were founded in 2001. And the fact that they've just lost their like, main spokesperson and main link to the unions, which is also what Stephen Joy was, which is far, probably a far more consequential thing that people haven't been really thinking about, is also a, um, it, it's a very good thing. Uh, and holding people up so that they get uh, destroyed by their own standards, it's standard Alinsky. That's how you win. Make people live up to their own rule book. Uh, and the rule book of the left says, any time a woman makes an allegation, you must believe her. Well, someone's made an allegation against Stephen Jolly. And back before the election even happened, the state election, people were making allegations against Stephen Jolly, as you mentioned, with things like sending dick pics and sending lewd messages. For decades, he has a record of this. He is an old-style socialist in more ways than one. Well, uh, ba back in... The, uh, the the old days, you know, you, you could, uh, you know, uh, ch chat up women and uh, seduce them without being accused of, of rape. But you, you mentioned uh, today that, uh, well, Socialist Alternative, at least, they've recruited a lot of like, LGBT people from the, the, the same-sex marriage campaign. And so there's not actually many uh, heterosexual uh, couplings in the modern uh, Socialist Marxist oh, yeah. movement. Particularly Socialist Alternative, they really made uh, hay while the sun shined on the gay marriage thing because they were involved in a lot of the organisation of the street protests with the Equal Love group. Every um, Equal Love co-convener and the campaign... That was a Marxist group. group. It wasn't a just a equality group. No, no, it was a Marxist group and it cooperated with the Equal Marriage um, campaign, which was more less street-based and more about organising people higher up in the establishment and older people. Uh, but they ran the university campaign on it. And uh, no, no member of the no campaign actually bothered to point this out because they almost wanted to lose. Now, Stephen Jolly, he's still uh, a Yarra councillor. He's still got that position. He can still be effective. And uh, Yarra City Council put out a, a statement. Oh, what's happened then? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yarra City Council put out a statement. It went for about uh, 50 words. It was the most uh, interesting statement from an official body I've ever seen put out. Pretty much said, uh, nothing to do with us. <laughs> well, we have had no complaints on our end. Please, please don't ask us any more questions. And Jolly, <laughs> at the council level, he also uh, was the, the trigger for uh, a lot of these, these local councils in inner Melbourne, obviously Darabin and, and Moreland, to, to not hold citizenship ceremonies on Australia Day, move their Australia Day uh, festivities. And that's uh, one of the things that um, uh, Neil Erickson, when he, was, when he was doing things around Melbourne, actually stormed a, a Yarra uh, c a city council meeting. And the Moreland one. Yes, Moreland but, one. but uh, yeah. that was uh, uh, when he got, you know, face to face with Jolly and they, they shouted in his face, shame Jolly, shame, and Jolly's just sitting there with his yep. arms folded, just sort of, you know, not, not reacting. Yeah, probably the most effective thing that uh, Steve Jolly, that uh, Neil Erickson's ever done. 
know, those council invasions. I mean, just talking to average normal people that I've uh, been talking to, that was actually very popular. The ones in Yarra Council, Moreland Council has Sue Bolton in it. She also came down to Melbourne when Jeff Kennett was elected. She's been originally from Toowoomba, was working in Sydney and Canberra at the time, tried to infiltrate the Greens as a member of the DSP, and uh, is now standing, is now, uh, as far as I know, one of uh, Victorian Socialists' two remaining councils, although Bridget O'Brien was a very close friend of um, Stephen Jolly, and she's on Yarra Council, so she'll probably um, resign from the party as well with him. So we'll see how it goes. So it's basically just a Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance uh, uh, left managing Victorian Socialists, which is, it's now just the, the university students, the, uh, uh, what, what you'd call the, the socialite socialists, the ones who've been, you know, been to private schools, highly educated, live in the, the inner suburbs. They're the ones who, they probably haven't read much actual of uh, Marx and Engels work, but they believe that they're the ones who, who are now going to smash the fash. No, no, probably a lot of them have read a lot of Marx and Engels. You can twist stuff like that any sort of which way you want. But yeah, they're um, Bobos, bourgeois bohemians. They, uh, they're the ones who are currently left in charge. And the big thing is the fact that the um, during the state election campaign, um, Stephen Jolly managed to get $50,000 for the campaign from the ETU, the Electrical Union, uh, through his union contacts. And he managed to get endorsements from several other unions as well, all through his union contacts. Uh, that's not going to happen anymore now for Victorian socialists. So they're more of them. They've cut off a bit of their link to the organised uh, union workforce by getting rid of him. But they didn't really have much of a choice. Like you say, a lot of their rank and file and the socialist alternative and socialist alliance um, are very woke, sort of gay and feminist types. And uh, like one of those gay feminist types actually quit the party in disgust, Mia Sanders, in Sydney. She quit uh, Victorian Socialists and she quit Socialist Alliance um, in disgust. And she's the reason, one of the reasons why we have so much information on that internal secret inquiry that was held before the Victorian Socialists uh, ran their state campaign. And back then it was pretty clearly all swept under the rug. Um, Jolly admitted that he had sent the uh, harassing text messages, said he was sorry and that he wouldn't do it again, and they brushed it all under the carpet. Now, the, the local socialists and Marxists, they're hoping to make a bit of a comeback with this a blockade of a mining conference in, in late October, and we've seen the same uh, local council action as well. Jolly's also uh, been involved in, in, in facilitating the, the organisation of this blockade of the, the mining Yep. Uh, conference and they want to make it another, they've actually said they want it to be another S11. Yeah, they've, um, Emma Black and Sarah Garnham, both socialist alternative activists, have come out and said they want it to be another S11. The entire the entire sort of blockade, uh, IMARC, IMARC is the mining conference, um, it's in late October, 20th to the 31st of October, I believe, and they want to pretty much just try and shut it down as a part of the the uh, continuation of their collaboration with the Extinction Rebellion group. Uh, like. The Extinction Rebellion it has been brought on as one of the three or four different working groups that they've got in the Blockade OMARC Alliance. And, um, but mostly it's being run by Socialist Alternative. All the posters were funded by uh, Jerome Small, the industrial organiser for Socialist Alternative. Um, the poster runs are being organised by Rida Hassan, who's the younger sister of uh, Omar Hassan, both of whom are of Socialist Alternative Omar. Hassan has, is the administrator of the planning group online for the conference, for the propaganda and uh, media outreach group. Omar is the editor of Marxist Left Review, the theoretical magazine of Socialist Alternative, and he was the one who built up the University of Sydney Socialist Alternative branch, which, and he was part of the organising group that blockaded Bettina Arndt when she was up there last year, I think, or this year. And, uh, yeah, so... The idea that this is anything other than a socialist alternative front is uh, absurd. I'm sure that the the socialists they'll down here in Melbourne they'll they'll continue to make noise and scream and and there'll be a complicit media who who will give them the the sound bites on the news. So even though they're obviously diminished in in resources, manpower, and actual uh, proper campaigning skills, uh, they'll, they'll con probably continue to run rampant. 
Oh, yes, I would advise everyone listening and everyone watching to keep an eye out for the blockade eye mark thing that will be happening October 28th. If it turns out to be a gigantic thing like they're planning, then you'll know that the Marxists have managed to recover from this little blip. But if it turns out that uh, it's a bit of a flop, then maybe their strength isn't as big as what we anticipated. I'll keep up the great work, Lucas. Uh, I know that you know you're very busy in your own life, but you know this is, yeah, you're doing some some great work here and exposing pretty much because uh, you reported about the uh, the allegations against Julie ten months before the the Age dumped that story. That's right. It's amazing when you uh, when you manage to break a story ten months before a a mainstream outlet manages to bother. <laughs> All right. Take care, Lucas. Thank you very much. Is Will's Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. All right, I hope you enjoyed that discussion between Lucas and myself. Now, Stephen Jolly's fate is not the only uh, development in local Marxist extremist community, or not just in Melbourne, but nationwide. Now, it's becoming widely uh, known now that we already have uh, one stabber in the in the, the Marxist community running uh, loose, but uh, another one could be on his way back uh, from prison in Bulgaria after being granted parole uh, uh, after he was convicted for, for murder in, in 2008, serving 11 years, Australian uh, Jock Pal Freeman. Uh, Lucas and I will get back together to discuss these stabby extremists in another episode. Now it's your last chance to ask some questions on entropy uh i've still got port film uh co-op uh, what, what, uh what's this question what is the verb for stolen uh yeah i'm not going to answer that one if you want me to say something related to a, 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 a some some kind of metal then you'll have to send me another super chat uh, port film co-op that's that's how it's going to work if you if you want to keep <laughs> Keep making these jokes. All right, if anyone has no further questions, I'll, well, I'll get on with my Friday night. You can get on with your Friday night. There's a few people there who are a bit eager to well, have a few drinks. I, I was just having a non-alcoholic beverage uh, before. I just said I was off to uh, drink some fluids. I didn't, didn't tell you what. Uh, you can all speculate what I was doing <laughs> yeah, while that pre-record was was playing in the in the chat that's that's going to be a guessing game all right so that concludes the australian alt media lineup for for this week and unshackled productions for this week of course i am back uh, here on sunday night uh, 7 p.m melbourne time on the tim wilms channel for sunday night edition of wilms front i don't have a guest lined up as yet i've got a few in the pipeline so i'll keep you guessing for now and after that, uh, 9 p.m., uh, Dia Beltran over on her uh, YouTube channel. She's hosting one of her first uh, debates. Uh, that's, at, that's at 9 p.m. Melbourne time. So make sure after you've watched Wilms Front, you tune in for that. And then on Monday, the, the alt media lineup continues. That's the new time, 9 p.m., uh, Monday night, uh, Melbourne time, on the Maddie Rose Live uh, channel at XYZ Live with Maddie Rose and David Hiscock. Dave is able to be a bit earlier now, which is amazing because, well, I've learned this from the Uncuckables, that he always turns up, what, maybe three minutes before we're about to start, and so if we start late, it's always Dave's Dave's fault. So, well, he's earlier now for XYZ Live, we'll see if he's any earlier for uh, Uncuckables, and of course, Uncuckables, I may as well mention it, the, the probably the, the premiere uh, a centerpiece of the Australian alt media schedule, 8.30 p.m. Melbourne time, every Thursday night on the Uncuckables YouTube channel. We just had a great episode last night. It was pretty wild. It was myself, David Hiscock, uh, Richard Wollstonecroft from the report from Tiger Mountain, and Dia Beltran. Oh, God, it was such a challenge controlling all those people. No, normally it's, it's Maddie who's the one who is the most difficult to control, but Richard is, is something else. He's bloody beast and uh, everyone always complains about dia but she she was fine she was she was lovely i i, I enjoyed it uh, so uh, that, that was fun she she finally got to make her uncuckables uh, debut and yes watch her watch her sunday night and then tuesday night on the 
Unshackled's YouTube channel. I co-host Trans Tasman Talk with my uh, New Zealand counterpart, uh, Dewey Debo of uh, Right Minds New Zealand. We'll probably be talking about because Jacinta Ardern, not only uh, uh, did she attend the UN Climate Summit in New York, she had a brief meeting with, with Donald Trump, a very short one, because or she, she said some pretty hard things about uh, Trump before, but she made a speech at the United Nations that uh, 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 the future of the world is, is borderless. Uh, so she basically wants a globalist, borderless world and contrast with Trump, which she said the future belongs to patriots, not globalists. So she went all out at the United Nations with the, the globalist agenda. It's rumored that Jacinda Ardern, uh, when she uh, retires, as uh, prime minister she's still she's not even 40 yet she she probably wants to to get a job at the united nations maybe be secretary general i mean she's basically loved by the the rest of the elites in the world just not her own country at the moment they're they're, they're getting pretty sick of her and of course uh, on tuesday nights as well it's the patriarchy hour over on the rational rise channel by james fox higgins and then, of course, Wednesday nights, it's another episode of Wilms Front, 7 p.m. Melbourne time, same channel. And then at 8.15 p.m., uh, Dear Bell Trans, uh, regular Wednesday night uh, live stream when she has a, a special guest. Even when one pulls out at the last minute, she, she always has one up her sleeve. So she, she's, she's very organized. I haven't quite had that experience yet on Wilms Front, but I... I've got I've got some backups, so there'll there'll never be a show that's that's cancelled due to some guests something happening to them. So there you go. And of course, or oh, detonation by my colleague Steel Archer that'll pop up pretty much any time on the Unshackled uh, YouTube channel. So if you see the the Unshackled YouTube show going live at any other time apart from 7 p.m. Melbourne time Tuesday, then it's another episode of of detonation. Uh, so Port Film Co-op. Uh, you will get back to your steel obsession maybe sooner than you think. Oh, Paul from Carl's actually got a serious question here on Entropy. Why are you not a Christian, but instead a libertarian? Well, that's an easy question to answer. That's because I just don't believe it's possible that a God exists. It just doesn't seem possible to me. That's, that's just what I believe. And are you implying that libertarianism is a religion well it's been called a cult uh, and there's certainly factions of it have cult-like statuses uh, i'm i'm a libertarian because i believe in ultimate freedom not just vague freedom but basically the right to be left alone that and we're not being left alone at the moment there's governments uh, social justice warrior wa warriors wanting to tell us what to do all the time trying to beat us into submission take away our free speech invade our families our children so yeah uh, libertarianism a healthy dose of it is 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 part of the solution here all right, and it's becoming towards the end of the month, uh, which means that now is the best time to support uh, this show, uh, which is through supporting the Unshackled. So Patreon, they uh, they take a pledge, ple <coughs> they process pledges at the beginning of each month. So if you still use Patreon, please go over to patreon.com slash the unshackled and pledge uh, there is also subscribestar.com slash the unshackled and we also have our paypal dot me slash the unshackled and i published an article on paypal today they're they're under investigation for uh potentially facilitating child pornography uh payments but uh, they, uh it's interesting they they're unable to paypal track track that uh, but they're able to identify uh fascists who who use paypal and and make sure they're deplatformed so i think they should invest a little bit uh, less time in their, their 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 fascism transactions unit or their thought crime unit and maybe go over and have like an actual uh crime investigation unit at paypal to invest actual criminal activity being used on paypal that's just my suggestion there is of course our membership program at the unshackled.net slash membership uh, where you can choose from various support levels you can choose whatever payment uh processor you want so there is heaps of options there and of course our online donation form the unshackled.net slash donate and our online store the unshackled.net slash store which has our most popular merchandise 
All right, um, as well as uh, visiting the Unshackled.net on a regular basis to well, catch up on all the other Unshackled uh, productions. Also to check out the latest written content on the Unshackled, the, the report from Tiger Mountain, our video reports, our steel shows. So make sure you visit that and that you're on the, the email list as well. You get a free ebook if you sign up to the Unshackled email list. You go to the Unshackled Battlefield Dot net. And of course, I've got a dedicated show website now, which is timwilms.com. And also, please follow me on social media, or I'm, I'm doing a lot more regular posting on those outlets. So please go to facebook.com uh, slash wilmsfront, uh, twitter.com slash wilmsfront, and I'm also on gab.com slash timwilms, and also minds.com slash timwilms. All right, that wraps up the show for this week. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday night, and I'll see you on the eve of the working week, uh, which is uh, Sunday night, uh, for another awesome show. I'm I'm very pleased that this channel is is growing rapidly, and that we've we've already got regular viewers here. Where we've already surpassed a hundred subs in the in the first week. I'm hoping to reach more milestones in the coming weeks. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel at the moment, uh, make sure you have and you click the bell to allow notifications, so you know. I know that I've got set times here, but make sure that that bell, you know exactly when we go live. That's that's really important. And of course, uh, all of these shows will be backed up on, on rationalrise.tv, the, the free speech, uh, self-hosted, anti-censorship video hosting website, uh, which is set up by James Fox Higgins of the, of the Rational Rise, which we're, we're aiming to be the Netflix of Australian uh, alt media. And you can also support, well, all of us financially there by taking out a subscription to it. All right, everyone, thanks for joining me on this Friday evening. I hope you have a, a great night and enjoy the grand final tomorrow. Uh, shout out to probably the, the maddest uh, Richmond supporter I know, which is, I mentioned to him earlier in the show, uh, Bernie Finn. He's, he, he's been uh, roaring on Facebook all week about the, the Tigers' uh, second grand final in, in three years. And if the Tigers win again tomorrow, I'm sure he won't be able to uh, pick himself off the floor for a week. So... Go Tigers! We'll see. We'll see. See. Hopefully, it's a cracker of the grand final, and the weather's nice. But until Sunday night, thank you for watching. See you next show. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes, and keep visiting the Unshackled.net to view all our shows, and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.